Welcome to the video lecture on imperialism. Um, pretty big topic on the exam at the end of the year and it's something that you definitely um, want to get briefed on, have a good overview on, and uh, be able to nail some multiple choice questions. So the period um, called imperialism, this is for United States history of course, um, we kind of can roundabout say is at the turn of the century, um, 1890, 1900, um, even a little bit prior to World War I, up to 1910 maybe. Um, and we want to go over the basic concept first, right? Before you dive into content and details and try to get a lot of vocabulary, you want to at least to be able to get the overview. And many times that alone will kind of guide you towards some multiple choice questions. And I think it's an important to understand the concept anyway. Concept is probably more important than content. Um, so our hand signal for imperialism is going to be belly rubbing. And, you know, in class I'll, I'll kind of rub my belly and I'll ask, well, you know, what do you think that means? And, of course, the answer is, Either you have a belly ache, um, which is not the case um, in this circumstance, um, or you are hungry. And that's the concept we're going with. Industrialization, the period of history that we just, we just did, hopefully you've watched the video lectures, um, the buildup of factories, the urbanization of America, um, creates this hunger. And the hunger, this is the region sensors, I'm not kidding you here, um, are this desire for raw materials, if you're going to make tires or if you're going to, um, you know, uh, there's a million examples, you know, you need more steel, you need more cocoa, you need more sugar, you need more, whatever the raw material is, that's, that's that hunger that's going to drive America to, to seek outward. Um, also is the hunger for new markets. Um, you can only serve, uh, you know, sell X amount of your product inside the United States. So if you can get into new markets, maybe China and the East and you know, other parts of Europe, you, you have a, a, an opportunity to, to, to make more money. Um, and I, I think there's also that hunger for military bases, this hunger for land to be able to develop our Navy, which really at the turn of the century is the, you know, the modern technology is whoever has the best Navy is, the, is king of the hill. So let's go over a couple conceptual reasons, a couple more kind of big ideas that, that drive us towards this. I think it's important to understand um, how uh, Manifest Destiny um, works and this idea that Manifest Destiny is more of a concept rather than a concrete idea that we went from A to B. That's, that's kind of the eighth grade Manifest Destiny and you do the Lewis and Clark thing and you Mexican War and you march across the mountains and, you know, the 49ers and California, see the shining sea, we're done. And, and really, it, it ex extends beyond that, over that. It's more of an idea that, that we're entitled to more, that it's, it's exploratory in our nature as Americans to seek out new frontiers. Um, on the test, sometimes you'll see the Turner Frontier Thesis. Um, uh, Turner being, Henry, uh, uh, Turner being a, a historian who kind of, kind of wrote about this idea that America always is seeking a new. And that leads to imperialism, because if you're in California, you know, all you see in front of you is water. Um, that doesn't work. You want to go beyond those borders. And we're going to find out quite quickly that means maybe Hawaii and Alaska, maybe our, our footprint in Latin America a little more hardcore. Um, the Philippines, you know, how that gets in there. But that we're going to be seeking outwardness. You could take this to modern day. I mean, there's a remote control car on Mars, guys. We did that. And that's also this kind of Manifest Destiny, Turner, Frontier Thesis, uh, the Star Trek, the Moon, Beyond, and, and imperialism, that belly rubbing, that, that's part of our nature. So a couple other reasons border kind of on a racist kind of like ideology. Um, very famous po a poem by Rupert Kipling called White Man's Burden. And um, that as well, this kind of missionary idea. I'm not coming down on the missionary concept or, you know, or religious stuff. That's not what we do in here. Um, but nevertheless, there is, a, uh, there is a, a fever of kind of religious kind of missionary work that's going on at the turn of the century. Um, and while that can be seen as a good thing and certainly, you know, save the children, um, if it's seen as kind of I'm here to rescue you, sometimes that can lead America into places maybe, maybe it shouldn't be. And I'm not trying to answer that question for you, but uh, definitely in Hawaii there, there was some missionary um, influence going on there as well as the Philippines. But this white man's burden, I'm not linking that directly to the missionary idea, but white man's burden is this idea that we need to save the savages. That um, we're civilized, Western civilization, with our 
um, tradition and our government, and we're certainly more democratic maybe than some other countries, and that gives this kind of this ethnocentric, remember that uh, word, well, you don't know ethnocentric, this kind of idea of patriotism and nationalism, and, you know, maybe we're number one. And I'm not, you know, I'm really painting extremes here, you know, black and white. Um, but um, definitely ethnocentrism and white man's burden allowed Americans to maybe silently or, or silently improve of some of these ventures because we felt as though we were doing good. We felt as though we were rescuing the Cubans and we were saving the Filipinos and, um, because they're better off under our wing. And you'll see some cartoons. I've shown you some in class where, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's marching up the, you know, hills of Cuba with, uh, you know, a savage slung over his shoulder and up on the hill is the you know, center of civilization. Um, so let's go into some specifics. We don't have much time left. I'm trying to watch my YouTube clock and there's about three and a half minutes. So you definitely want Spanish-American War, 1898. Um, the Spanish had occupied Cuba for hundreds of years and um, around the turn of the century, um, the regent's question a lot of times relates right to the raw material, to, to sugar. that. Um, you know, the United States had built railroads in, I think, the 1850s in, in um, Cuba in order to get that sugar out of there. Um, but the Spanish definitely are controlling Cuba. So there's a couple of reasons how we get into Cuba. One of them being um, the idea of yellow journalism. That's on the test every year. Yellow journalism means when you're telling news, but you're painting it in a way that maybe exaggerates the facts, that is used to lead more, to, um, more than to inform and I won't get into modern current stuff, but there are claims that some news stations and some magazines and newspapers are yellow journalistic in their nature, that their job is to sell papers and it's more interesting if you really kind of lay it on and get it juicy and, you know, make it, make it sexy and make it sizzle and um, that gets people to read your paper. But it also can maybe be a reason for war. Um, I'm not going to get into the politics of it all. Look at me. Look at me biting my tongue. Good for Mr. Hughes. Um, but at the turn of the century, there were articles. William Randolph Hearst was publishing stories out of Cuba. Um, the Spanish were made to look monstros you know, like monsters, like they were you know, starving and killing and maiming and raping. And Not that that maybe didn't happen on individual you know, cases, but it was definitely painted in the news as a rather large problem. And uh, um, boarding our ships, and you'll see news clippings of a, an American woman half nude with a Spanish, you know, conquistador's hands all over this Americano. And uh, this story in America it kind of revers up that ethnocentric kind of nationalism, kind of, you know, what are they doing? They, you know, we need to get them, the revenge kind of idea. Um, so uh, that's one thing that's going on is yellow journalism. Uh, William Randolph Hearst, I think, the, you know, I forget who it is now. I think it was the president said, give me the, you know, you give me the pictures and I'll give you your war. Something related to that. But this idea that uh, yellow journalism was a big effect. You also have the um, white man's burden as one of the causes of the Spanish-American War. Um, there's a side note called the DeLome letter where the Spanish um, were uh, communicating with their officials in Cuba and they were basically calling William McKinley a weak, ineffectual president that he wasn't going to do anything, he wasn't going to invade. and That ended up in the newspapers and that revered up nationalism again and uh, that ethnocentric, I keep saying ethnocentric, this idea that we're better than the rest or that patriotism and pride kind of, you know, rise up and that can be used sometimes by government to, you know, whip us into a war. Um, but the biggest one is, I only have a minute to explain this because we're going to have to do a part B here, is the, the sinking of the USS Maine. And uh, to this day, I'm not exactly sure of the facts, but I know that when that ship sank outside the harbors of Cuba, um, the United States uh, papers made it look like the Spanish blew it up. And maybe that didn't happen. Maybe it was a boiler room accident or it was sabotage or um, that news story was the Pearl Harbor, the 9-11 of, of that war. So the United States declares war on the Spanish in Cuba. And in 1898, it's called the Splendid Little War, the Six-Week War. We whoop some Spanish behind. Um, we're going to have to take a time out. I only got 10 seconds. And let's go to uh, Part B to get to uh, kind of the effects of that war. So... Uh, See ya.